with uh, Dr. Neil Postman, who's the chairman of the Department of Culture and Communications at New York University and the author of 20 books, including Amusing Ourselves to Death and Technopoly. Dr. Postman, thanks for making time for us today. You're most welcome. Doctor, it's been, uh, well, 10 years since you wrote uh, or published Amusing Ourselves to Death, and I wonder if we might start with just uh, the idea of whether your views of television have changed or uh, uh, Transform themselves in any way over the last decade? <laughs> well, uh, if I were writing the book now, I think I would uh, uh, say pretty much the, the same thing uh, I said then, uh, but I think I would uh, be even more uh, outraged and uh, alarmed than I was then. I think maybe there'd be less. How has television fundamentally changed us? Yeah, well, I mean, in, in many, many ways. It, uh, uh, so far as uh, psychic habits are concerned, uh, it's helped to uh, uh, transform us from uh, print culture to, uh, to a visual culture. Uh, in, uh, specifically, it's had effects such as uh, uh, the decline of uh, literacy, and also the decline of uh, serious reading. Uh, there are 40,000 books published uh, in English every year, so I don't think I could say that um, there are fewer books, but I think the big effect has been in, um, on our reading habits and how we read. How is that? Has that been a good thing or a bad thing on the balance from your perspective? Well, from, from my uh, point of view, it's, it's a bad thing that um, uh, it's harder to find people who uh, take reading seriously and uh, as well, incidentally, as writing because uh, writing has been affected especially uh, among the, the young. Uh, so uh, when uh, culture... Uh, loses uh, some of the power that it uh, achieved through illiteracy, uh, then of course uh, it's something to lament. Uh, but in addition to that sort of thing, its effect, uh, for instance, on our uh, politics has been enormous. Uh, most uh, political campaigns now are pretty much run on the basis of uh, 30 second TV commercials so that um, uh, political knowledge now means uh, more having pictures in your head rather than words in your head and most candidates know this and this is why they um, uh, run these uh, highly visual and striking and even entertaining TV commercials. Now, from my point of view, this is, uh, this is another uh, a bad development uh, because uh, to make a politics strictly into an emotional matter, uh, that is your response to certain images, uh, rather than uh, uh, a reflective and analytical uh, way of thinking that seems to me to be uh, a decline in uh, discourse that's very serious. Uh, so, and, and I could go on, I mean, uh, I could even uh, touch on uh, almost every uh, chapter that was uh, in the Amusing Ourselves to Death book. I mean, I think it uh, affected uh, religion uh, in that. Uh, yeah, with the electronic preachers. Yeah, with the right, all these evangelicals who also do their programs pretty much the, the way that uh, a producer of any entertainment show uh, would do them for television. You talk about how the telegraph and the telephone changed us, and then, of course, in Amusing Ourselves, you talked about uh, the impact of television. At the same time, you are careful not to describe yourselves as a Luddite and, and have uh, agreed that these technologies aren't going away. Uh, 
what about the new ones that are emerging? I mean, we there's an incredible list of new things, everything from whatever they're called, the PDGs or those Newton machines that run their run your computer out of your palm to 500 channels, the internet, web pages. Yeah. Well, uh, there's a lot to say about this question that you asked. I mean, in the first uh, instance uh, concerning the Luddites, uh, I, uh, you're right, I don't consider myself a Luddite, although I admire uh, the Luddites. Most people who call uh, me or others Luddites I don't know too much about the Luddites. I think if they did, they might uh, uh, use that word as, as a compliment, because these were people who were uh, trying to preserve uh, a, a certain way of life, especially for their children who were being uh, used as virtual slave laborers in factories. But, so one can hardly uh, blame them for resisting a technological and industrial change. But in any case, uh, I'm not about to be in favor of busting up the machinery. Uh, what I do think is that um, uh, we have to learn uh, as a people to be more in control of what we allow our technologies to do to us. And uh, when if you go back to the days of uh, the invention of the printing press, or even into the 19th century with the invention of telegraphy and photography, uh, it, it would have been understandable that most people did not give too much thought to what might be the long-term consequences of these technologies. But as you say, uh, in the uh, country we live today, there, uh, which I think we can aptly call uh, a technological society, uh, where almost every day we're being urged to uh, pay attention to and use some new technology. Uh, I think we can't afford to have our eyes closed about these things. We have to learn to ask the right questions and to make um, uh, modest and uh, prudent use of technologies because um, while it's true that all new technologies will give us something, uh, it is also true that they take something away. And we have to be very careful about uh, how much will be taken away. So I'm in favor of um, not Ludditism, but uh, serious technology education so that we develop a population of people who uh, have some distance from technology and are able to um, make uh, uh, some prudent uses of technology without being overwhelmed by technology. We don't have a real good track record, as you pointed out, in being prudent, though, and I'm wondering uh, given the changes that things like television have already wrought in the culture, what measures should we use to judge the new developments as good or bad or prudent or wise? Well, I, uh, I have uh, an answer to that question. I can, I can provide you with some good questions rather than measures. Um, I, I do think we have to ask about uh, new technologies, uh, especially the ones you just mentioned, um, what is the problem to which any one of those technologies is a solution? You know, there are technologies that are solutions 
great idea expressed in uh, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. I'm not sure people believe in that anymore. Um, uh, or the great idea in, uh, expressed in, uh, in uh, Emma Lazarus's poem that is on the base of the Statue of Liberty about uh, America as a great uh, melting pot, um, a place that welcomes the, you know, the, the tired and the poor and the disenfranchised. I think Americans once believed in, in, in great measure in some of these stories. Uh, uh, I call them story narratives. I, mm-hmm. I don't mean to minimize them in any way by saying stories, but they are <clears throat> accounts of, of uh, what um, human society is supposed to be about. And I but don't, Doctor, don't, none of those things fit comfortably inside the box. That's right. Uh, but what I think has happened is that as those uh, beliefs in, in those ideas uh, has uh, declined, uh, uh, it has been, they have been replaced by the, what I would call the great god of technology. That is, people, uh, starting, by the way, with the uh, commandment that uh, of technology that thou shalt have no other gods before me. Uh, so that Americans have uh, now do believe uh, that their whole future as a people uh, is tied to our technological creativity and the uh, rapidity with which we can uh, uh, subordinate all of our social institutions to the sovereignty of technology. And I think this is a very bad idea, uh, but it, it is quite strong among Americans. And um, I might add, increasingly strong among other peoples around the globe. I mean, uh, you find that uh, those in Western Europe, for example, and uh, in Germany and Scandinavia and France um, have begun to uh, believe pretty devoutly uh, in that idea. Doctor, I'd like to go back uh, a moment to your comment about the 500 cable channels because in one of your books, and I forget which one it is, but in one of your books you made the statement that uh, civilization or society is actually built on the elimination or destruction of information rather than uh, its explosion, the explosion of information. For an American in the mid or late 20th century, that's kind of a jarring concept. Yeah. Well, it's not, uh, I do have a jarring concept here, but that's not quite it. What, what I meant to say is that up until the 19th century, all societies, including our own, suffered from information scarcity. Uh, we needed information in order to solve uh, both uh, physical and symbolic uh, problems in our culture. Now, beginning in the 1840s, with the invention of telegraphy and photography, uh, and then for 150 years after that, uh, we solved the problem of information scarcity. But in doing so, created another problem that no one's ever faced before, which is information glut, information incoherence. Um, now information comes to us from myriad sources, unasked for in great volumes at great speed. And what I meant in that, that I guess it was in Technopoly that I talked about, Problem is, 
how to get rid of most of it, because most of it we don't need. So we have to try to figure out the way to control the flow of information so that we can have access to that information that we actually need in order to control our lives. But hasn't the information glut undermined those institu those mediating institutions that traditionally... Absolutely, and, and uh, you're right there that I did write a, a lot about that, that, that institutions like uh, our religion or the church uh, schools, political parties, uh, and so on, uh, have only functioned as uh, information management systems. And I mean by that that they, uh, each one of those institutions has some theory about the world which helps to guide us to know what sort of information we need and what sort of information we don't. I mean, the uh, people, for example, who uh, believe, even as we speak, that the Bible is the Word of God, use the Bible as an information control system. The, the Bible will tell them uh, what sort of um, words they may use and which ones they may not and what sort of... Um, movies they can see and, and which ones they shouldn't. And it, it gives them uh, uh, a framework in which to deal with information. I think the increase in that country of people, um, the people now take in uh, fundamental uh, Christianity, derives in some sense from that need that people uh, do need some guidance to know what sort of information uh, is pure garbage and what sort of information is useful. But the same sort of function uh, was uh, and, uh, performed by, let's say, schools. I mean, if you look uh, at a uh, university catalog, in effect, that catalog is an official statement by the faculty of what sorts of subjects are worth one's attention and by what is not in the catalog, you have a statement of what sorts of subjects are not worth attention. And I would say it's the same thing about the political parties and other large uh, social institutions that their traditional function, uh, in not solely but in part, has been to tell us how to use information and what sort of information we need to have. Now, as those uh, institutions lose some of their authority, uh, then, of course, we become more vulnerable than ever to information glut. So that uh, if one, uh, uh, if one uh, doesn't believe in, in the uh, instructions of any religious system or any political party or any school curriculum, then in effect one is saying, well, I'm, I'm not going to be guided by, by that institution in figuring out what sort of information I should pay attention to. And if you do that, then of course you're exposed in a, in a most confusing way to this torrent, this Niagara of uh, information that pours in on, the, uh, on your consciousness every day. It seems to be a period in American culture where um, information is good because it's information, not yeah. the content thereof, and choice is good because it's a choice. I mean, I mean in the sense that uh, sometimes people want more choices without considering what the content of the various choices is in the, in the same way that they want more information without, as a principle rather than imagining what they're going to do with it. Yeah, well, of course, that, uh, that's part of the problem uh, and uh, it implies uh, a misunderstanding, uh, as I see it, on the part of uh, uh, many people of, uh, about what culture is in the first place. I mean, one somewhat oversimplified way to say it is that culture uh, is uh, uh, a series of 
people reject that idea, and, and if they say, well, culture is not that no, but it's yes, meaning that everything is open and ought to be and must be open to everybody, uh, then I think we have a new conception of what it means to live in a society. And I think that could be very dangerous. By the way, I'm not implying that what I just said, that I think um, uh, we should uh, say no by having legal penalties. Right. I don't mean to say that uh, you know, we should put people in jail who, uh, who refuse to accept the no's. But uh, there was a time we didn't have to put people in jail because that if people accepted the legitimacy of the institutions that form their society, uh, then they accepted the constraints that those uh, uh, institutions placed on, um, on their behavior and their beliefs. Uh, so uh, it was, it's not a question of uh, uh, punishing through legal means people, but uh, it, it was a question of getting some sort of consensus about what the institution stood for. Dr. Sherry Turkle wrote a book a few months ago called Life on the Screen, and, it, and the premise of the book was that people's sense of self-identity is changing because of the the experience they're having with computers, the window model of having multiple windows open at the same time, people are now developing the concept that they may have multiple identities. Um, Did she? Uh, uh, I admire Sherry Trickle uh, a lot, and, and uh, I particularly liked uh, uh, the, her early book. Um, I guess it was called the, was it the Second Self. But I didn't read this book. Does she say? that um, the development of multiple identities is a good thing? No, she didn't argue that. She really just uh, indicated that she, she explored a, uh, why and how that was emerging and what its implications might be. She didn't pass judgment on it. But I'm interested in um, what your impressions are, using that book as an example, for uh, what these new technologies are doing to our sense of privacy, our sense of personal identity, our sense of permanence? Well, of course, uh, uh, the, the, the first answer to that is that in, in all those uh, cases, uh, the new technologies are leading to change. Uh, the idea of um, uh, uh, personal identity uh, or privacy, for example, is, uh, is truly undermined by computer technology generally. Um, and uh, I've always been interested, by the way, in the concept of the speed. Uh, of course, this is not just computer technology, but beginning with telegraphy and going on right through the idea of thinking fast as a great value has always interested me. I think it was from the time I uh, I took tests in school, and we were given you know, 25 minutes to uh, complete the test, and then the teacher would say, time is up, pencils down, and if you were one second late in getting a pencil down, your whole test was thrown out or something like that. I mean, we have lots of examples of how... Uh, Technologies going back to the 19th century have put a great emphasis on speed and, of course, efficiency um, uh, and uh, repeatability and uh, standardized uh, responses. Um, uh, I, I mean, I, I would say that um, you know, it would take uh, would take a longer than we really have to go over in depth. Um, how uh, each technology might be affecting uh, such uh, deep conceptions as uh, a sense of privacy and uh, uh, personal identity. And by the way, I, I, I would think um, that Sherry Turk would be a good person to listen to on, on this uh, subject because uh, she's gone a fairly deeply, in, especially with uh, young people, and how uh, computer technology alters their notions of uh, good and bad. By 
by the way, on the point we were making before about um, a, a culture being a, a, a system of no's, uh, uh, it interests me that in the Ten Commandments, uh, two of the first three commandments happen to be about human communication. Uh, and they're both uh, no's. Uh, the uh, the third one, uh, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. Remember to keep holy the Sabbath. That's uh, that's not the third one. Mm. Are you, no, no, no. Well, we'll have it depends. Here we are. <laughs> which, Bible, yeah, which Bible? Which, well, I hope you're not going to dispute my second one, which is uh, thou shalt not make any graven images. Right, right. Uh, and uh, people might ponder that one. That is in a, uh, um, uh, a set of uh, instructions about how to live an ethical life. You would have thought it would have been enough to say, uh, don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery, and so on. Um, why would God or Moses or whoever you wish to claim wrote the Decalogue a care about how we codify the world, what sort of symbols we use? And I think that is there because it was understood uh, uh, at the beginning that uh, the symbols that people use to to uh, make the world known to themselves will affect everything about them, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, including their sense of um, uh, truth and their sense of intelligence and their sense of privacy and so on. Um, so this idea that we're talking about, which is that uh, technologies uh, cut pretty deep into our psychic habits and values is really uh, a very old idea. I mean, uh, uh, not only does God uh, talk about it, uh, Confucius talked about it, and of course Socrates talked about it uh, when in the Cedrus, uh he um, uh, worries about the effect uh, uh, on us of, uh, of writing. You know, he, he didn't write any books himself, and were it not for Plato and Xenophon who did, we'd know almost nothing about him. But uh, as Plato represents his argument there, he says, well, writing uh, will help us, will contribute to it our losing our memories. Because if, you're, if you can write things down, you don't have to remember them. And then he says that it will change our uh, concept of privacy because he says that uh, once you write something down, you never know whose eyes will fall on it. And he even says it will change our concept of education. It will destroy the dialectic process. He says um, writing forces a student to follow an argument rather than to participate in it. So Socrates knew about this, too. Now, um, your, the question you're asking me, I, I really, it's hard for me to answer because I'm not that smart. But one thing I know is that uh, the new technologies will be changing in fundamental ways uh, how we believe and what we believe in. Well, it, as it might impact, for example, organized religion and our, our sense of God and eternity, what have you seen happen just in the last 15 or 20 years? Well, I mean, one of the things I alluded to before, I think there are uh, uh, the, the rise of um, uh, fundamentalism is to some extent a, um, uh, a reaction against uh, technological sovereignty and uh, uh, information gone amok. Uh, I think, uh, by the way, the, there's, a, there's the rise of um, what you might call tribalism all over the world uh, that is people.
one line of argument on these technologies is that, well, everyone or more people are going to have access to more knowledge. Knowledge is power. Therefore, these technologies are going to drive a kind of global um, heightening of the democratic sense. Um, yeah, well, my answer to that is uh, uh, that this is, this is not the case and it's not the way to look at it. That, as I said before, uh, people who um, are saying that we need more, uh, we, need, we need greater access to more sources of information, are really talking about a 19th century problem that's already been solved. I mean, in America, there are 17,000 newspapers. There are 12,000 magazines. There are about 400 million television sets, uh, maybe 500 million radios, not counting those in automobiles, 41 million photographs are taken every day in America, 60 billion pieces of junk mail come into our mailboxes every year. There are 27,000 outlets for video. I mean, if there's one thing Americans are not short of its sources of information. And then to hear people say, well, we really need to get a computer into every student's hands in school, and we have to have this and we have to have that. Uh, they strike me as, as reactionary in the sense of they're not realizing that the problem they're addressing humanity started to address in the 1840s, addressed it for 150 years, and solved it. And these people are simply not accepting the fact that that problem has been solved and in the bargain created a, a, another big problem, and they're not addressing that problem at all. Is power going to be wielded differently because of these technologies and distributed differently? Well, of course, yes, because um, there are always winners and losers in, uh, in uh, technological development. It's sometimes hard to know at the beginning who's going to win and who's going to lose. Uh, with um, computer technology, uh, the big winners at least at this point, are large-scale organizations, uh, the IRS, the Pentagon, banks, uh, airline companies. It's obvious that uh, computer technology uh, is a great boon to them. Uh, also, in certain uh, high-level fields in the natural sciences, physics, for example, and astronomy, uh, obviously, uh, work can be advanced there tremendously uh, through computer technology. So those people are winners. Uh, I don't know if the average person isn't uh, a loser here. Uh, of course, the winners are going to try to convince the losers that they're really winners. Uh, that's the way winners usually support. Uh, what is the average person lost, though? Well, I mean... Uh, uh, computer technology gives access um, to their private lives, which uh, which uh, would have been available without it. It uh, reduces people to numerical units. It subjects them to more examinations. Um, uh, uh, and here's another one. I mean, I'm especially interested in this because um, uh, I'm in a school of education. The, uh, I think teachers are big losers, but uh, they don't seem to realize it. I mean, I read the other day that um, the state of California is at least discussing the, uh, uh, spending something like $11 billion in the next uh, 10 or 15 years to wire every classroom in California. I know the state of Maryland is starting this year uh, with, uh, well, modestly with $53 million, which they hope to make into $100 million to wire classrooms. This is even talked about here in New York City. Now, when school started in New York City this fall, there were 91 
1,000 children who show up for whom there were no seats. And classes were, in fact, being held in bathrooms. Now, I, I would say anyone uh, who's got a problem like that and then is talking about spending hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to connect kids up to the uh, internet just doesn't get it. And, uh, and is, in fact, a very serious loser. I mean, school boards are always saying, when teachers ask for more money, or administrators ask uh, to hire more teachers, well, if it's a good idea, we'd like to do it, but we don't have the money. Well, then where is all this money coming from to wire all the classrooms? Uh, where, where, does this, where does this $11 billion in California or the, even the more modest $100 million in uh, the state of Maryland coming from? I'm sure if uh, the teachers in Maryland had said to Governor Glendening, uh, who's a really a great advocate of wiring the classes, look, well, before we do that, why don't we hire some more teachers and pay the teachers we have more? Um, this would be really good for the kids in Maryland. Uh, uh, he probably said, well, I'm sure it is, but we don't have the money. But for uh, uh, wiring the classes with the Internet, they do get the money. So I would say um, the computer industry is a real big winner in this. You know, people like Bill Gates and so on, they're big winners. I read he's the richest man in America. Um, I think teachers are losers here. But the strange thing is, you don't hear many teachers complain about this. Doctor, yeah. I'm sensitive to your time. I have one other question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, and I wanted to talk about this Aspen conference very briefly. There was a manifesto at a recent Aspen Digital <laughs> Information Conference that mm -hmm. argued that the central event of the 20th century is the, quote, overthrow of matter. Um, yes. yes, I saw that. What do the vocabulary and assumptions of the digerati in magazines like Wired say about their worldview? And is it something we ought to be concerned about? Well, I'm concerned about it. I, I don't know how things look in Aspen, Colorado, but um, I, the only sense I could make of that when I saw it was this, that uh, in, it's not so much the overthrow of matter, but the overthrow of the biological roots of, uh, of human existence that is increasingly uh, we we get to know each other and we get to know the world through symbols, through electronically displayed images, and uh, we where well, we don't uh, smell people and and we don't see people in uh, in all their uh, you know coping with their biological limitations, so that. It just seems to me that m most of the new, uh, uh, well, for example, on the internet, you can, you know, you, you, no one knows who you are or what you look like, and uh, you can become anything you want, and bio, your biological framework has nothing to do with it. So that's the only sense I could make of it, that more and more we're uh, moving away from uh, the, uh, the, the, the biological roots of our being and more and more to merely our symbolic capabilities. And what's wrong with that? Well, because we are biological.